<clears throat> Have you ever felt unqualified or undeserving of something? Just raise your hand. All right. I'm, I'm a big raise your hand person, but I like to know you're still awake. So that, that gives me an indication. But yes, I think as you look around, every single one of us can identify with the feeling, the experience of, of, of being or feeling unqualified to do something or undeserving to receive something. Now, I want to ask a little bit different question. How many of you have ever looked at someone else and thought, they, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, they are unqualified. They are undeserving. They don't belong here. This morning, we are going to look in, at a couple of passages uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. So if you have your Bible, uh, I invite you to find the very first book of the New Testament, uh, the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, we're going to be in chapters 9 to begin with, and then in chapter 12. The Gospel that bears this name, Matthew, immediately brings our attention to somebody who understood deeply what it meant to feel unqualified and undeserving. Matthew, a Jewish man, became a tax collector, a Roman tax collector. So the Romans would employ Jewish people in the places that the Roman Empire had conquered and, and taken over. They would use their native people to collect the taxes. And the way that they did this was the way that you got the tax collector job was that you would bid on it. And you would tell them, I can get you this amount of money. And so they would take the highest bidder. And the way that you received your pay, your income, was by taking more than you said you were going to collect. And so tax collectors were extortionists. They extorted as much as they could out of the people. And many of them, including Matthew, became quite wealthy. It was a lucrative job. But it was a job that then alienated you from your fellow man, your fellow Jewish man or woman. You were excluded from the synagogue. You were no longer no qualified to be a judge or a witness in a trial. And you were looked down on by everyone. And so that's Matthew's background. That's Matthew's story. And there was a day that Jesus, and it's, it's implicit in the text that Matthew has, has already heard Jesus teach. He's listened to his message. And something has been resonating in Matthew's heart. We've talked about our word chesed and how it causes our hearts to, when we encounter it, when we understand it, when we experience it, it causes our hearts to resonate. Something within us yearns and longs. It wants to experience this. It wants to express it in worship. And Matthew has heard Jesus' words. And he's listened to him. And something has resonated in his, heart, in his heart. And I believe he wants what Jesus is talking about. But I don't think that he thought that he could have it. Because he was a traitor. He had sold himself out. He was excluded. He was undeserving, unqualified. And a lot of his peers would have said, yep, he sure is. He doesn't deserve God. He doesn't deserve God's love. He certainly doesn't deserve Jesus. He's a sellout. He's a traitor. He rips us off. And there was a day that Jesus was walking down the road near Matthew's tax booth. And no doubt, un, undoubtedly, Matthew saw him. And, and you can sort of just imagine, I, I, I've already informed you that I have a well-developed imagination. And so I do believe that God has given us an imagination. And I do believe he wants to use it. And there's a sanctified way in which we can. And so I want you to imagine what it might have like, been like to be Matthew in this moment. I want you to think about your pulse rate. Right? Have you ever had a situation where your, your heart rate went up and you didn't want it to? Anybody? All right. Yeah, all right, thank you. All right. And I was like, am I the only one who experiences that? I'm sure Matthew's heart rate is probably increasing steadily. It's probably well north of 100. Here's Jesus walking down the street. And in fact, he's not just walking down the street. He's walking directly to my tax booth. And you can only imagine what he is probably anticipating Jesus is going to say. 
that there's going to be some sort of rebuke. There's going to be some sort of, Matthew, why are you doing this? Matthew, you're a horrible person. Matthew, you're a traitor. Matthew, you, you are out, you're on the outside. You, you're excluded. You're undeserving and unqualified. But instead, we'll find that Jesus walks up to Matthew's tax booth and says two words. Follow me. Matthew, leave. Leave your tax booth. Leave, leave this life that you've chosen to live and come. Follow me. So Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 9, is where we pick up Matthew's telling of this, this experience. He says, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. Right? He becomes one of Jesus' disciples. In fact, we know that he becomes one of Jesus' closest disciples, one of the twelve. And after this incredible experience of Jesus calling him out of his life, even though he didn't deserve it, and even though I'm sure he felt unworthy, he experienced what it's like when the God of the universe, the one from whom he deserved nothing, the one from whom you deserve nothing, the one from whom I deserve nothing, chose to give him everything. And so what do you do when the one who owes you nothing gives you everything? What would you do? Well, Matthew decided to have a party. Does this sound like a good idea? Anybody? He's like, this is an occasion for a party. This is an occasion for a celebration. And so he invites his friends. And who are Matthew's friends? Anyone want to guess? Tax collectors, because no one else will hang out with you. You can't go to synagogue. You can't do many things in society. And so... He invites fellow tax collectors. Verse 10, while he was reclining at the table in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came to eat with Jesus and his disciples. It's Luke that tells us that Matthew threw a great feast and that there was a large amount of tax collectors and others at the table. And so it's a big, it's a big party. Uh, it's a big meal. And there's, Matthew certainly is, is overwhelmed. And no doubt, undoubtedly, he probably wants his fellow tax collector buddies to have what he's had, to experience what he's had. Because once you experience chesed, once you experience God's love and his grace and his mercy, you naturally want others to have what you have, to know what you know, to experience what you've experienced. But notice in verse 11, when the Pharisees saw this, and the Pharisees were a group of Jews who took the Old Testament scriptures incredibly seriously. Right, they were, you know, they, they, they get a bad rap, and, and rightfully so, and we'll even see why today, but they were a people who took God's word seriously. And they very much believed that they were in the right because of how seriously they studied, took, and even sought to obey, to do God's word. And so it says, when the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And there will be many times that the Pharisees ask things intentionally trying to trap Jesus. Their motives are clearly not, not good. But in, in this case, it seems quite evident, quite obvious, that this is just an honest question. They're, they're really confused. And, and all of us can identify with a time where we've been confused, where we didn't understand something, and we asked an honest question. And so they ask... They ask uh, the disciples, why does your teacher, your rabbi, why does he eat with these people? You, he shouldn't be associating with them. That makes him unclean, right? That, 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 that defiles him. Why is he doing that? Now, verse 12 says, when Jesus heard this, he said, it is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. And then he's going to say something very important. He says, go and learn. And this was a very, would be a very rabbinic way. This is the way a rabbi would, would teach. He would invite them to go and to learn. And this is going to probably offend them a little bit because they are the ones who say, we need to go and learn. We are the ones who have learned. We are the teachers. We are the ones who know the law inside and out. But he said, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy. And here's our word right from Jesus' lips. The number one word that in the Septuagint, the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the number one word that is used to translate chesed is mercy. 
And here on Jesus' lips, we know it's mercy because he's quoting, we know it's chesed, because he's quoting Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. So he's quoting the prophet Hosea, and he says, I desire chesed, mercy, and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. The one whom we talked about yesterday, Jesus, who was full of chesed and truth. The one who delights in lavishing his kindness, his grace, his compassion, his mercy on the undeserving has done it again. And they're struggling to understand. And so Jesus gives them an invitation. And it's an honest invitation. He says, I want you to go and I want you to learn. I I want you to understand what it is that God wants. I desire chesed, not sacrifice. So what's, what's the issue here? What is Jesus trying to, to say? You see, there, there were a couple of different traditions at this time, even among the Pharisees, and there were those who followed a more extremely strict interpretation of the Old Testament scriptures. There were some that even taught that God creating Gentiles was a mistake, that Gentiles were not even a category of human like themselves. There were those that thought that pushing people away is the right way. And there were others who taught that God wanted to include the Gentiles if they'd come to him. And that studying Torah was to be done by gathering in and not pushing out. But this question, likely, li- likely asked by a Pharisee from that tradition that thinks Gentiles should not be included, that outsiders should not be included, and a tax collector was worse than a Gentile, basically. And so Jesus invites them to think, to go, and to learn. What's he saying? Jesus is wanting them to understand that God cares about the heart. You see, the Pharisees were really good at the external. They were really good at at doing all the things that they thought they were supposed to do, and they did them. You know, but you can identify with this. All of us have done something just because we thought we were supposed to. All of us have done something just because we had to, right? All of us probably obeyed our parents at some point, but on the inside we thought, I don't want to be obeying right now. Anybody with me? All right. Can we turn that camera? No, no, sir. (laughs) We will not turn the camera around. Your parents don't know. But actually they do, but that's another story. (laughs) We all know what it's like to, to obey or to do something just because we have to, because we fear the consequence, because of some external reason. But God's not looking for people who will just do things externally. God doesn't just want us to keep a set of rules or to do certain things. God cares about your heart. And God desires that you would experience and encounter He Himself for who He is. That you would understand Him and know Him. That you would experience salvation through His grace and through His mercy. But that you would know His covenant, faithful, loyal love. That your heart would be changed and transformed. When I think about this, I think about the Apostle Paul, right? Because here we have another man who was passionate about the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, passionate about them, so much so that he thinks people who follow Jesus are, are, are false converts, that they are enemies of God, that they are a threat, that they are a problem. And so he believes that they need to be eliminated. He's present when Stephen is stoned. He is one who is active in the persecution of the church, right? In fact, in the book of Acts, it says that Saul was causing havoc in the church. He was often the instrument of of finding names, finding people, having them thrown into prison, possibly even executed. And Paul thought he was doing the right thing. He thought he was being faithful to God, but one day, by God's grace and in his infinite mercy, God intersected Paul's life. Jesus himself appears to him. He reveals himself to him, and he is radically and marvelously and incredibly changed. And something happened that that Paul realized that it wasn't just about the exteriors. It wasn't about conformity to the law, but it was about receiving grace. It was about experiencing chesed through Jesus. And his life was changed. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul says this. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present... So did you catch that word, by the mercy or the mercy of God? 
Right? That's our word. And Paul had come to know the chesed of God. He knew what it was like for God to treat him in exactly the opposite way. You know, if we think about who doesn't deserve God's grace, who doesn't and could not have earned it, it would be Paul. Right? If anyone deserved God's wrath, if anyone deserved his judgment, it's why, in fact, it's why Paul describes himself as the chief of what? Anybody remember? Sinners. Right, because he had become aware, I am so undeserving, I am so unqualified, I did such horrendous things. I hated Jesus, but he saved me anyway. And he changed me. And he says, I appeal to you. I I am appealing to you, my brothers and sisters, by what? The mercy, the chesed of God. And he says, I want you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. You see, when God says, I desire chesed, mercy, and not sacrifice, he's not saying that he does not desire our obedience, our service, or even our sacrifice to him. But what he is saying is that it doesn't come from performance. It doesn't come from just doing and earning. It comes from knowing and experiencing God's love and his grace and his mercy and being transformed from the inside out so that these acts of service and love and obedience come from a heart that's being transformed by God's radical, incredible love, his kindness, his mercy, his faithfulness, his loyalty. So he says, I want you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, set apart, and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. You see, the Pharisees that heard Jesus quote Hosea 6.6, that was what a verse they would have memorized in Sunday school. Now, obviously they worshiped on what day of the week? Saturday, and they didn't have Sunday school. But you get what, are you with me? Hosea 6, 6, what a verse they would have met, we memorized, that was VBS day one. Are you with me? They would have, they knew, but Jesus says, I want you to go and learn what it means. You don't understand. And this morning as I was going over my notes, and I, I just felt overwhelmed to pray for you, to pray for all of us, that God would help us to truly understand and know the depth of his love for us. That you, would, that you would grasp who he is. And that you'd be overcome by that because God wants you to know him in that way. And Jesus calls that. There's another scene in Matthew chapter 12. And the reason we're going to go there is because he's going to quote the same verse. So turn over to Matthew 12. Jesus is going to quote Hosea 6.6 6 again in a little bit different context. And it's going to help us to see and understand what God is looking for and what God wants to do in our lives. Matthew 12, verse 1, it says, At that time, Jesus passed through the grain fields on the Sabbath, on Saturday. His disciples were hungry and began to pick and eat some heads of grain. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, See, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. You see, the Pharisees were so consumed with keeping the rules and doing the things that they had lost sight of the heart of God. You know, we can be so intent on knowing something intellectually and wrapping our mind around it, or so intent on doing something that we can miss the heart, the reason, the why. And so here is Jesus and his disciples. They're traveling. They're hungry. They're passing through this field of grain, and they're picking off some of the heads of grain, and they're plucking them, and they're eating them. And all the Pharisees see is, they're breaking the rules. They're breaking the rules, right? They're like your counselor. Like, that's all they can see. (laughs) Just kidding. Aren't you grateful for the incredible team of counselors we have? Why don't you just give them a hand? I, I get to work pretty closely with your counselors, and, and I have done that for 15 years, and I can say without a doubt, this is one of the strongest teams we have. I'm, I'm thankful for each of you, uh, and they do love you, and they care about you. And yes, they will enforce the rules because that's part of their job, but they love you and they care about you. But these Pharisees, all they saw was rule. They, they didn't see hungry men who needed something to eat. They just saw rule breakers. And here's the thing, they weren't even breaking God's rules, they were breaking man's rules. The the Pharisees, they had developed hundreds of rules on how you were to keep the Sabbath. Right, God created the Sabbath. It was important, God designated a day of rest. And it's important in our culture, we don't really value that anymore, and it is to our great detriment. The Sabbath was important, it mattered. 
but they had made it something that God had never intended. God said, the Sabbath was made for man. This is a day for you. A day to rest. A day to refresh. A day to reflect. A day to worship. To, to reset. But they couldn't see that. And they believed that their rules went all the way back to Moses. They had traditions that said when Moses was on the mountain for those 40 days uh, and 40 nights, that, that there was these rules. And so that's why they would even say, we are disciples of Moses. You remember John chapter 8? And Jesus is having this back and forth with the Pharisees, and they're like, we're disciples of Moses, but we don't even know who your dad is, right? And so Jesus is going to respond in verse 3. He says to them, haven't you read what David did when he and those who were with him were hungry? How he entered the house of God and they ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for him or for those with him to eat, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath day, the priests in the temple violate the Sabbath and are innocent? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And for a Jewish person to hear that in the first century, they'd have thought, what? The temple? That's the the place where God manifests his presence on earth, right? That's, That's the place where heaven and earth get the closest. What do you mean something greater than the temple is here? He says, something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what this means, and here, here is, the rebuke is a little bit sharper than in Matthew 9. If you had known what this means, I desire chesed and not sacrifice. He quotes Hosea 6, 6 again. You would have not condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And in this moment, not only does he proclaim his deity, but he proclaims his power over their dearest point of orthodoxy. You see, the Jewish people at this time, they, there were so many divisions, and they all disagreed on things, right? And, and, and they all thought they were right, which is kind of how we are still today, isn't it? They all thought they were right. But the one thing that they almost all agreed on was the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was important. But here Jesus says, I am Lord over the Sabbath. I'm the one who created the Sabbath. And I am the one who would know whether anyone was breaking the Sabbath or not. He was claiming his divinity. He was claiming his authority. He proclaimed that he was Lord over the very thing that they held dearest. And God wants you and I to come to the same place. Yes, we should hold things dearly. Studying God's word, theology, those things are important. It's part of how we know God. We need to do it, and we need to do it well. But we need to remember that all of that should always lead us to who He is. It should always lead us to His heart. It should always lead us to His truth. And it should always lead us to love Him more and more deeply and to love people more dearly. If your theology is not leading you to love God in a deeper way, in a richer way, in a fuller way, if your theology does not lead you to love people Not just people who are like you, not just people who agree with you, but people. If it doesn't lead you to love them more deeply, you're doing your theology wrong. You're doing it wrong. These men, they thought they were doing their theology right. They thought they were so right, but they were so wrong because they missed the very heart of God. They missed what it was all about. Jesus was indeed greater than the temple. He was greater than all of these things. But they couldn't see it. Jesus says, I desire chesed, not sacrifice. Jesus wanted them to get it. That that their faith just couldn't be in their head. And listen, you cannot just know God intellectually. Now that's saying, not saying that we don't use our intellect in our knowledge of God. We do. God gave you your brain. He gave you an intellect. He gave you the capacity to think. He gave you the capacity to reason. And God wants us to use that. But you cannot just know God intellectually. You cannot just know God up here. You must also know Him here in your heart. Now, obviously not physically in your heart. I know that. But the the understanding that the heart is the representation of who we are, our inner being. And Jesus wanted them to understand that. That's why he said, go and learn. Go and understand what this means. 
Yesterday, I, I, I asked you to picture Jesus as you would picture him. Sitting with you at a coffee shop. Look at you. And what would Jesus say? There's one thing I can be confident that he would say to all of us as he looked at us with eyes of compassion and kindness and grace. And I think he would look at all of us and say, I desire chesed, not sacrifice. It's not about striving. It's not about earning. It's not about doing. It's not about keeping all the rules. Right? Yes, obedience, but not obedience that's external conformity. He says, I want you to know me and to know my heart, to know my love, to know who I am. And when you know who I am, you'll want to worship me. You will desire to obey me. Remember, Jesus told his disciples, if you love me, keep my commandments. Obedience to Jesus is essential, but it has to flow out of a heart that is experiencing and knowing and being transformed by God's incredible love and grace. I want to give you two points of application this morning, two things. Number one, Jesus delights in offering his said to the undeserving. Jesus delights. N- not, not just, you know, all of us know what it's like to do something because we have to. Go tell them thank you, your mom said, right? And you said, thank you. Right. We all know what it's like. Go practice. Some of you delight in practice. Some of you need a nudge. Some of you need a shove. I know, I I was one of those campers sometimes. But Jesus desired, he's not reluctant, he's not hesitant, nobody has to nudge him or push him to show his chesed. He delights, it's his joy. And so I just want to ask you the question, have you encountered, have you received God's love in your life? Have you been born again? You see, we are all by nature separated from God. We are all sinful people. All of us, the Bible says, have gone our own way. Right? There's not one that's righteous. No one in this room by themselves has any righteousness, has any merit, has any reason that they could come before God and be accepted. None of us. Not myself, not your counselor, not our staff, not our faculty, not any one of us. But God delights in lavishing his grace on the undeserving. And we experience that when we come to that realization that I am a sinful person, that although I was created by the God who loves me, I am separated from him in my sin, that the wages of sin is death, separation from God now and for all of eternity, but that God desires that I wouldn't stay separated from him. Right? The Bible says that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. God desires that you would come. And it doesn't matter if you think, I am like that woman who had lived a sinless life in Luke 7 that we talked, sinful life that we talked about yesterday. Or I'm like Matthew. But it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. You can come to Jesus because he came to you. We would never come to him if he didn't come to us. He is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the one who presents his grace to us, his mercy. And God delights to lavish his grace. And if you've never encountered Jesus as your savior, I want you to know that he is willing to save you if you will believe, if you will trust him, if you will acknowledge your need, if you will confess your sin, if you will receive him as your savior. I want us to think about this delight in offering us this this chesed also. And the fact that sometimes We know that we've been saved. We know that we belong to God. We know we're his child. But maybe you've been struggling to just say, I'm struggling to experience God's love right now in this season of life or in this situation. We talked about that a little bit last week as we talked about lament. We talked about the times where God seems distant or far or even absent. And maybe your struggle is because of something that has happened to you, something that's going on in your life. Maybe you say, it's really because of what I've done. But regardless, I want to invite you to ask God to reveal himself to you while you're here, that you would encounter him. If God seems distant, if you feel like you're far from him, I want you to know he delights to lavish his love on you. Number two, Jesus desires that we would demonstrate chesed through our lives. Chesed is not just something that we receive. It's not just something that we sing about. It is all of those things. It's not just something that changes us, but it's something that we do. And it's easier than we realize to become those hypocritical Pharisees. 
It's easier than we realize to go from a place where at one time I knew I was an undeserving sinner. At one time I knew I was unqualified. And Jesus saved me and he rescued me and he brought me into his kingdom and he made me his child. I'm his masterpiece. I'm an heir to his glory. And somehow along the way I forgot that that was not something I deserved. And then I start looking at other people and I have categories of people in my mind of people who are less deserving than me. And I look down on people. And so I want to ask you a couple of questions. How do you see people? How do you see people? How do you treat people? How do you treat people who are not like you? How do you treat people who don't deserve for you to be kind to them? Right? Because there are all kinds of people in our life that would say, they don't deserve my kindness. They were rude. They were obnoxious. They were mean. They were unfair. They're evil. Whatever we might say, they don't deserve that from me. Jesus said that he was kind even to the what? The undeserving and the ungrateful. God doesn't want us to just go through the motions. God doesn't want external conformity from you. He wants you to know his chesed, his covenant love. He wants you to know that the one from whom you deserve nothing has chosen to give you everything. And when you understand that, it changes you from the inside out. And it's my prayer that you would not just know about this, not just believe it's true, but that it would change you from the inside out. That you would truly understand that God delights to lavish his has said on me, not just once, but over and over again. And when God saved you, he knew you would fail. He knew you'd mess up. He knew there'd be some days that you acted totally unlike his kid. But he saved you anyway. And he delights to to lavish his love on you. And then he wants you to reciprocate that love in the way that you live, in the way that you see people. The Pharisees, all they could see was rule breakers. They couldn't see a room full of people that had gathered around Jesus for an incredible meal because they were hungry for grace and mercy. They couldn't see hungry men in a field who desperately needed something to eat. They could only see their rules. How do you see people? How do you see people? Let's pray. Father, I I thank you this morning for the privilege that we have to just begin our day together in your word. I thank you that your word is living and powerful and true. And Father, I pray that that our hearts would truly grasp who you are. I pray for that, that one person, maybe that is wrestling with whether they believe or not. And Father, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them And that you'd bring them to a place where they are able to trust you in faith. And that they are able to taste and see that you are good. And that you are a God who forgives and invites and saves. I pray for the one who is struggling because your love feels distant and far. For whatever reason, circumstance or sin or it could be anything. Father, I pray that today they would see that you still look at them with eyes of compassion and grace. You still love them and that they might come close to you. Father, I pray that we would be honest in our hearts about how we see people, how we treat people, how we talk to people, and that you would change us so that we would be ones who reciprocate your love through our lives. Father, I pray that we, having experienced your mercy, would not be conformed to this world, but we'd be transformed so that we might live lives that please and glorify you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.